yeah, thank you for joining us. I know, well, Alexis already said it's snowing in Ottawa, but in Amsterdam, it is very nice outside. So we're very appreciative to have you joining us virtually rather than enjoying the good weather. Um, yeah, so I work at Framer Frame. We're an exhibition space in Amsterdam. Um, we've got some online programming in the works. That's really exciting. So um, follow our social media and also you can always keep up our website to stay in the loop on those to uh, join us for future events. And I'm going to go through a couple of the housekeeping rules to uh, kind of help the session run a bit smoother before I turn it over to the host. So um, the first thing is to uh, turn off your audio when you're not speaking, just in case there's some noise in the background. And then um, it's probably best if you turn on your video when you're speaking, because it's a bit un easier to understand people when we can see their mouths movi moving. Um, and then for discussion points, uh, just raise your hand if you want to say something or write your name in the chat so we can uh, try to keep track of everyone. Uh, that worked pretty well last time, just raising your hand. So I think it should work this time. And yeah, so don't feel obligated to stare at your screen. You can turn off your video for a little bit and move around if you want. Uh, I think Alexis does have some planned breaks in the middle. So uh, yeah, you won't have to stare at your screen the whole time, but if you feel like you need to turn off your video, uh, feel free. And then Alexis kind of brought up this point of that we, whenever we're on like visual, virtual calls that we always just stare at ourselves. So she's kind of challenged us to maybe play with ways of not just looking at yourself, which I'm doing right now. So um, <laughs> it's difficult. Um, maybe she has some better ideas for how to do that. I don't know, maybe turning off your video or, um, yeah, I don't know, just try. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, now I'll turn it over to Sissel, one of our hosts tonight, who initiated the first reading rooms with Frame or Framed, which we had two during the Elsewhere's Within Here exhibition, which were physical, and we've had one online session before this, and we have a couple people rejoining us, so that's really great. Uh, so, to you, Sissel. Thank you, Ashley. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I see uh, some faces that I saw two weeks ago and some familiar faces from outside of this. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really happy that you're all joining us today. Um, so my name is Cecil Moriton. I am an artist based in the Netherlands, in The Hague, um, but I'm originally from Denmark. Um, and I'm also part of uh, the artist initiative called The Reading Room, together with artists Jonathan Roos and Flora Resnick. And we've been doing the reading room as um, a sort of bi-monthly event from 2015 to 2018, and now uh, as a more nomadic kind of uh, event series. And it really started when we were in um, art school and had a lot of theory thrown, up, thrown at us as, as artists, but at sometimes not really given the space or the time or the tools to unpack the theory and really understand it. Um, so we created the, the reading room as a, as a place to sort of uh, come together and study a text together uh, outside of the institution um, of the art academy or university. And we usually invite uh, a guest, um, philosopher, artist, curator, um, anyone who has a specific interest or expertise in a given topic. And we ask them to choose some texts that they would like to share with this uh, often very diverse um, group of artists or makers or anybody who really would like to join. Uh, so I wanted to just um, say that the format is really never to be a seminar um, or sort of like traditional lecture, but it's really an opportunity for us to read something together and try to understand it and unpack it together. Although, of course, we're very lucky to have somebody here who has a special relationship and knowledge of, uh, of what we've been reading. Um, having said that, um, I think it's uh, such a huge pleasure and a gift of inviting somebody who has this great knowledge and a special relationship to the texts. Um, so I want to thank Frame of Frame for making that uh, gift possible today for all of us. Um, and at just a few words, I wanted to just say really quickly uh, about 
why I call this event Plastic Hypersea. It's, uh, it comes from this exhibition that, uh, that Ashley was talking about, Elsewhere is Within Here, that was curated by Jolene Ong uh, at Framer Framed in Amsterdam uh, in, uh, in the fall. And I made a work there that was called uh, Water Thieves and Time Givers, which is dealing with the presence of uh, hydrophobic chemicals, specifically a hydrophobic chemical called PFOA in the Dutch landscape and specifically um, sort of what kind of uh, bodies are uh, exposed to this chemical to a higher degree than others, but actually also how PFOA to a certain degree is uh, existing in all of our bodies because it's so ubiquitous. And the question of time and, and bioaccumulation, how uh, chemicals are challenging us to think of this very sort of porous relationship between our bodies and our surrounding environments that's especially often um, mediated through water. And what's interesting about hydrophobic chemicals is that they're avoiding the sort of natural uh, diluting um, qualities of water and sticking behind in our fatty tissues. Um, and I've since then been thinking a lot about, I think maybe as we all have of this sort of this uh, viscous porosity that I think is a term that we also encountered in one of the texts that we're in a certain sense porous but there is also a viscous aspect of our bodies we're not just completely fluid there are certain things that are kept within our membranes of our bodies and there are certain things that are passing through us and I think also as uh, our current situation um, of, uh, of COVID-19 has shown that certain bodies are also more exposed than others, which is always something that you have to come to term with when you look at uh, toxicity. And last, uh, well, when I got the, the opportunity to uh, curate these events with Frame of Frames online, I really wanted to use this moment in time to also think about, well, how do we then continue to think through this kind of embodiment that is perhaps not that our bodies are stopping at the skin, but that we're constantly in relationship with our surroundings and with other people. How can we use that to think about things that are perhaps more persistent, such as chemicals or um, pollutants in the environment? So that's kind of why it's called plastic hypersea, because it's our bodies being plastic, and hypersea is this concept of the primordial soup that was fold it back into our bodies. Uh, that is this kind of like very fluid uh, existence of our bodies. Um, and then our first, uh, our first uh, meeting two weeks ago, I uh, was, uh, I had the pleasure of inviting uh, my uh, friend and collaborator, Danny Atmos, who's also here today, who um, was co-hosting the first session of the, plas uh, of the Plastic Hypersea Reading Room. Um, and, uh, and Danny and I know each other because she invited me uh, to take part in a project that she's doing called Toxicity's Reach. And um, in our brainstorming process for this uh, project, she introduced me to Alexis's work. And in the last session, we were indeed reading um, two chapters from Alexis's work called uh, Purity Politics, Living Ethically in Compromised Times. And um, that I also felt like was a really big gift of being introduced to Alexis's work, um, because for me, it is an incredibly generous and incredibly sharp book, um, which I think for me as an artist sort of gives me a vocabulary that I felt like I could sort of grasp at, but I didn't have the, the, the really like the, the language to express it. And Alexis talks about the incredible uh, complexities dealing with toxicity and how it's embedded into uh, social political structures in an incredibly eloquent way. Um, so I would really recommend for you to buy the book, <laughs> a little plug for, for Alexis's work. Um, and now I wanted to give a little bit more of a formal introduction uh, to Alexis. Uh, so Alexis Shadwell is a professor at Carleton University's Department of Sociology and Anthropology in Ottawa in Canada, um, where she's a cross appointed with the Pauline Jewett Institute of Women's and Gender Studies 
uh, and the Department of Philosophy. She works in social and political theory with a current focus on complicity and complexity as a ground for ethical and political action. She also works on the history of AIDS activism in the Canadian context. And with that, I'd like to uh, give it over to Alexis to say a little, uh, maybe a bit about her work uh, and introduce us to the work that we've been reading for today. Thank you. Thanks, Isla. Um, it's really nice to see you all. And, um, and this is really, I think, uh, so wonderful. I'm always, when I write, I feel like most of the time what, I'm, what I want to do is be like, look at these cool things that other people uh, said, and let me tell you why they're so useful and great. Um, and that's like, I think, kind of one of my main um, theoretical orientations is this kind of like, how amazing that these people are saying amazing things. Let's talk about them together. And in academia, it's so rare that we get a chance to just do that. Um, because so much of the time we're being asked to uh, say, like, here's the thing that I think, right? Like, here's my great idea. You should do my great idea. And um, so this morning in one of the online groups that I'm involved in that's keeping me sort of minimally on the rails during the pandemic, there was a sort of younger person in their 20s who was saying, um, I don't know how to tell if this person that I'm texting with is flirting with me. Um, I mentioned this Horace poem and they said that that would always work to get them in bed and is that flirting or not? I can't tell. Um, and so we were talking about this um, sociologist here, Zimmel, who he basically had this definition of flirting as the most, like the highest form of human activity, um, something that is non-instrumental, that perpetuates a sense of play and the possibility of people being malleable and transforming themselves with this kind of appreciation and delight for one another's presence and activity. I mean, he also thought that conversation was not really different than flirting. Um, and so one of the things that I'd like to forward for us as a kind of theoretical orientation toward reading these books is a kind of uh, orientation of flirting. Um, so non-instrumental, seeing what emerges, uh, having this appreciation for connectivity and sparkiness um, and not needing to be sure that we know. And at the same time, as I said to this person, um, I do also think that there's something that is really important about being able to say, are we now flirting? Um, I, I need to understand what's happening. And so for me in reading today, that's partially about all of us being willing to say, I do not understand what's happening in this text. Um, so in my experience of these two books, um, in Eli Clare's work, I often have the feeling that I do not understand what's happening in terms of my emotional, political, human response to the theoretical work that he's doing, um, because I feel like his thinking and capacity is so vast and networked and um, generous that I sometimes am, I have this kind of experience of ontological shock with it. And I think it's, that's a space that actually he is um, occupying in a really useful way, which I'll say more about in one second. With Mel Chen's book, I'm much more often just like, I actually don't understand what they're saying. Like it's very complicated and, um, and, and they're working in a different discipline than I'm familiar with. So they're a linguist um, and and they also, as I just said to um, folks that when we were getting set up, this chapter that I suggested we read together is um, in narrative theory, there's that the idea of the spear point. So a, a place in the text where a lot of things come together and you're like, oh, uh, and, and they're most um, piercing when they have a long spear throw, right? So we're hitting this chapter at the end of a lot of things coming together. And it's this chapter is one where it's like, shh, things really, um, they really entangle and come to a point. So I want us to be really just like, let's actually try to even just understand what they're saying. And I'll do my best if everyone in this room is able to say like, can you just explain what animacy means? You know, 
I'll do my best and, and everyone else can also do their best. So I'll just say something really fast about how these um, books are um, coming out. So my work is, is on complex, complexity and complicity. Um, I think because of uh, the, the work that I did in my last book, um, against purity was really trying to think about what happens if we start from if we start from the understanding that we're never going to be able to be uncontaminated. Like what happens if we start politically from being enmeshed and implicated if we already are um, penetrated by substances that are making us sick, if we're morally complicit in making other people and ecosystems sicken and die. Um, what happens if we start from being in the middle instead of imagining that we could be outside those relations of suffering? Um, and, and I wrote that book really fast and with a kind of, um, I had just moved to Ottawa and into a sociology department and I was um, giving up trying to be in conversation with philosophers who are very deeply invested in purity and um, the elimination of discipline and subject and I experienced coming here and being in sociology which is a very weird discipline as extremely liberating and what it liberated was a kind of um, like a voracious uh, gluttony of putting people who aren't normally in conversation in conversation with each other um, and then one of the things that emerged from that is I think there are a lot of holes in that book or things that after I finished it, I felt were extremely unfinished. And so for the past couple of years, I've been working a very grinding administrative role in my department uh, of being the graduate coordinator for, we have more than a hundred grad students. And so I spend a lot of time just trying to make the institution be less cruel to vulnerable and precarious workers. Um, and and some, that's done something to my um, intellectual work. It's made it a little bit smaller, I think. Um, so I lately have just been working on um, what it means for white people to claim white supremacists as our kin. So for white people who are against racism to not pretend that we are um, free from benefiting from white supremacism just because we oppose racism. So I have this little book in progress called Claiming Bad Kin, which is about kin relations with um, people and systems that we hate. Uh, and then I've been working and this is feeling very important right now on uh, anarchist theory, uh, starting from Peter Kropotkin about mutual aid. So about the idea that in the context of all of us being co-produced and co-contaminated, we also are always um, have the possibility of being deeply interested in helping one another. Uh, so I can say more about that. But I picked these books and I was so um, happy to have the invitation to think about what books I would like to talk about with um, smart and interesting people who are not inside my discipline. Um, because they both continue to really echo through everything that I am interested in right now. Um, so there. Uh, yeah, so. Um, So, and you can look, so we've put the, um, the Google Doc that we used to organize today, there's a link for it in the chat. And if you like to know what's going to happen, you can go and look there and we're going to try to sort of keep to the schedule of it. If you're the kind of person that likes to just roll with the flirtation and not know what's going to happen, don't look at the Google Doc. Um, both are good ways to be. Is everyone feeling good about me talking a little bit about um, sort of a core, some core ideas from Brilliant Imperfection? Um, 
for a little minute. Okay. So um, Eli Clare uh, wrote a book that came out 20 years ago called Exile and Pride, um, which I really recommend to all of you. It is a book about um, queerness and disability. Uh, it's about growing up in a part of Oregon where people who love the woods, their only employment is uh, cutting them down. Um, it's about living through child sexual abuse and um, being trans. Uh, it's about the difference between rural organizing and urban organizing and what it means to be queer and rural. It's a very short book, um, incredibly dense, incredibly rich. And, um, and Eli Clare is one of the kind of foremost theorists of disability working in North America today. One of the things that he started in Exile and Pride is a um, very close attention to um, troubling what is a really core political move inside disability studies. So in disability studies, there um, was an important critique of a model of thinking that what happens when someone is disabled, so a conventional model, standard model is, if you're disabled, there's something wrong with you, and we need to fix you. So we need to um, make you, give you surgeries so that you can walk in a, without assistance. We should um, medicate you so that you don't have to stim. Um, so there's a whole bunch of practical stuff that happens around basically trying to cure disability. Uh, coming mostly out of Britain, out of the UK, there was a counter movement to the medical, so that's called the medical model. Disability is a medical problem, we'll fix your body. A uh, counter movement was called the social model. So this was, there isn't anything wrong with my body. What, what's wrong, what disables me, is the social and physical infrastructure of this world. So there is nothing wrong, the social model says, with being in a wheelchair. What's wrong is that there are not curb cuts that allow me to move my wheelchair around. What's wrong is that there are only stairs to get into that building. So the social model really, in an important way, um, allowed people to name, I am not the problem. This world is the problem, and we can change this world. And that approach um, was, Eli Clara was really important to forming some of that um, social model. But also right away, even 20 years ago, he forwarded this um, third space that was saying, yes, there is, um, there is nothing wrong with my body. There is something wrong with the world that disables me. And um, sometimes I do want to be able to have less pain or um, to, to make decisions about what I do that acknowledge that I don't have to be what's called a super crip. So crip is usually a derogatory term for disability, but in this case, a reclaimed term that says, I don't wanna be someone's inspiration. Uh, how amazing that you have Down syndrome and you can date. How wonderful that you lost a leg, but you still run a marathon. So that's super crip. That's the idea that because you're disabled, you have to be even more amazing. I'm telling you all of that because um, in that work, Eli Clare was really strong about saying, we don't need a cure, we need a transformed world. And in this book, um, Brilliant Imperfection, Grappling with Cure, he does this incredibly brave thing that writers often don't do, which is to say, what happens if I was wrong about that? Or what happens if the way I was right about that also did some harm? So he's giving us this theoretical technology, I think, called grappling, which is, uh, he frames it as neither wholehearted acceptance nor outright rejection. So an approach to being in relation to the complexity of the world that we're in 
that he also thinks of as letting ourselves be jostled. Um, so letting ourselves critique and um, letting ourselves um, say why we want one thing and not another. So the ideology of cure, the way that he's framing it for us, is that cure is always bound up, the idea that there's a damage or a harm, it's always bound up in um, a story, a lie, a fiction, about um, the way that things could have been had this damage not been, been done. Um, and the particular strands of that story in thinking about disability are always also connected to eugenics. So to the idea that we want the human race to be one way and not another. They're connected to a deep narrative that comes from capitalism that is based on the idea that we're not worth anything if we're not productive. Um, it's connected with an idea that if you, so like in Eli Clare's case, he hasn't ever not had cerebral palsy, right? His experience is always that he is someone who's had cerebral palsy. So there's no before state that he can go back to. And imagining that he would want to is actually a form of uh, violence, of aiming for eradication of his whole, his whole life. So the grappling here is also saying, and yet sometimes we want cure, even though it's embedded so much in these violences and these horrors. Um, so he's really interested in what it looks like for us to examine the ideology of cure. And one of the things that I think we can notice when we um, read this book and think about disability is um, what happens for us, so for example, when we're thinking about um, Cecil or Danny's work about confronting toxicity in our environment, like if I want to be able to grow uh, garden vegetables and eat them, it it's, makes sense for me to say I don't want these hydrophobic chemicals to be showing up in my zucchini. Um, so why? And we can notice how much of the time when we turn towards saying, I don't want this, we line up with the current way that um, flourishing is distributed in the world. So we say, I don't want this because I don't want the children to be born disabled. So we can notice the, the way that we, or I can't imagine that these health problems are good, right? They're health problems. So how do we have a refusal of environmental devastation that doesn't also end up being a refusal of the liveliness and goodness of disabled lives, the liveliness and goodness of, um, so folks that read um, my chapters from last week, the liveliness and goodness of intersex and trans and queer lives. Um, like how do we think about what it means for humans to be an indicator species without that devolving into racist, ableist um, narratives. So that's the complexity of the ideology of cure, I think, for me. And what we thought we could do is, um, because we're a little bit too big a group to meaningfully have introductions, but one of the things that's gorgeous about this space is that we can actually be in relation with one another. Um, is that we'll go into breakout groups now. So Zoom will invite you to go to a room and you'll click the link and then magically you'll just be with, I think, three or four other people, Jean. Um, and, uh, and we'll um, introduce yourselves there, say hello. Uh, and the question that I would offer you for consideration, if you want to talk about it together, is to, to think about this space of grappling. What do you think about this, this idea of grappling? Um, or another way to say that is, uh, what are the ways that you see in your work um, or in your thinking, uh, times where you're charting spaces between 
acceptance and rejection? Or wh where do you reject things in ways that you're worried about your own rejection there? Any questions about that? Um, that uh, next task? So we thought we could do this for 10 minutes. Oh, oh sorry, 15 minutes, did we say? Uh, no, it's fine. Ten, ten minutes. I, okay. I will close the, the breakout room when it's time. <laughs> okay. So then you'll get a little thing that says your breakout room is going to close in 60 seconds. That will almost Im immediately mean that you have lots of interesting things to say. We are sorry. And, uh, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about um, well, what comes up there or violences of cure, depending on what happens. All right. Everyone okay. ready? Yeah. Okay. And just one second. And I think I'm not going to join a breakout room. Is, is breakout room six going to be okay without me? Um, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Okay. All right. Wait, where am I? Jesus. Yeah, always making the breakout, breakout rooms is a mess. <laughs> yeah, I know. And do you think um, the time when I did it, I was able to just save the same breakout rooms? Can you do that? Uh, I, think they, I, can, I think I can do that, yeah. Okay, it doesn't really matter if you can't, but it's kind of nice for people to be with the same people if we're gonna do it twice, which I hope we do. Yeah, yeah, right, I'm, okay. gonna, I'm gonna go see one of the breakout rooms. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi, sorry, just, this was the breakout room with the less people, so I just joined this one. <laughs> Oh. Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, my name is Evie. I'm a master's student in Amsterdam for museum studies. Oh, I think you're muted. Okay, make a sound. Okay. Oh no, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Maybe I can yeah, go yeah, while you you're good. Oh, okay. while you check if you <laughs> okay. Uh, my name's Joe and I um yeah, I work at a music festival which was obviously not obviously, but was cancelled because of everything. Um, but I also host some reading groups, monthly reading groups in Amsterdam. Uh, so yeah, I'm just interested in how other people host them, but also in these kind of like thematic discussions, which is kind of what we also do. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also, uh, yeah, yeah. Lots to say. Very nice. I think you can try now. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is Evie. Um, I'm a master's student in Amsterdam in museum studies. Um, and I'm interning at Frame of Frame, which is how I uh, know about the reading room. Uh, yeah. um, just maybe good to follow that because I am also at Frame of Frame. Uh, I'm the exhibition coordinator. And right now, the public program kind of coordinator, if you can call that that. But yeah, and I'm also based in Amsterdam. Um, I am Monse, and I am also a master's student, but I'm in Oslo at uh, uh, it's a fine arts master. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyone wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The question was. Um, uh, wait, I have the was question. Just grappling. Not grappling. Uh, grappling uh, or other ways we've charted space between acceptance and rejection. Uh, 
in our own uh, works, lives, uh, mental spaces. Um, kind of a hard question. <laughs> I mean, maybe this is really big and very general, um, but I think kind of the, like the current social system we're in, is like maybe a capitalist system is, is not the best idea for everyone, but everyone kind of accepts it because it's the way it is. And it would be really difficult to imagine and make steps forward to changing that system so there's a kind of like a grappling of every day knowing that you know people are dying every day as a maybe a direct or indirect result of things that are happening within our control um but then yeah how do you navigate rejecting it because on an individual level it's very hard to do anything meaningful yeah that's kind of a big <laughs> overarching statement but uh that's kind of the first thing i thought about uh, in terms of grappling between acceptance and and rejection uh maybe i i can kind of think of one but it's it's so uh, for me one that gets a lot in the way is um has to do also with expectation and and i don't know happens a lot in the workplace for example uh, uh coming from I'm, i come from mexico uh coming from there like the way you know people work in europe for example or there are certain standards uh, kept in europe or people think about it a certain way or um which for example in in mexico or you know in other uh i don't want to say third world but in other developing countries is different uh you know, after having studied and lived my life there and worked there, uh, coming here and having, um, uh, I don't know, there, there's a, in, an interesting tension between, you know, what how the system works here and how you adapt and, and certain things that are sort of taken for granted in here um, regarding how people work or access to certain services. This is, I'm not making anything too, too specific either. Uh, but I, I, there's a tension there between, you know, knowing that other people in other places are going through way harder ways of living. Mm. Um, you know, that I once was there and in my personal case, you know, feeling like the, now in Amsterdam, having a relatively nice uh, uh, life, I guess, and, and job and stuff. Um, kind of thinking, uh, how did I did I escape? Like like am, am I like taking my things and running away from a bad situation? And also, you know, coming here and like having my bar super low about certain things that in here are very common, and then thinking that there's no point in fighting for justice or for equality in here because comparatively things look fine. Um, so there's like an interesting mixture between. Uh, it's it's a different kind of grappling it's a, it's a grappling where you sort of shoot yourself in the foot i think um i don't know maybe that was too confusing I, I, it's it's not well developed in my head uh <laughs> in language <laughs> but i don't know do you mean like like what you expect of others so yeah you kind of get used to everything working a certain certain way and then when it doesn't uh yeah it's more difficult to to figure out because you're so used to a certain level of expectation and something like yeah the bus is, says it's supposed to come on time so it should come on time and then maybe you go somewhere else and everyone's like yeah the bus doesn't come when it's supposed to come and you just have to live with that but everyone else is like no if you're gonna have a bus schedule then Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean to, to, to make like, to make like a very specific example. For example, with um, uh, I don't know, with wages or stuff like vacation time. The big, I just saying this because I had a discussion this yesterday. You know, I, I worked for an entire year in a big museum in Mexico, and I didn't have a single vacation day because that doesn't exist in their contract. Mm. Um, and coming here, like I, I, I am in this mode of working where I will not have vacation because I 
it's, I don't, you don't get that, you know? Um, and I see other people not getting vacation and then I think, oh, but that's fine because, you know, in Mexico, no one has. But then it's like, okay, no, but we're not there. Like, 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 mm -hmm. I, you know, or, or if someone, you know, what people would say, oh, it's a first world problem here. Like there are people in other places that don't have food or stuff. Yeah. But it's and still I, a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like that, yeah. that doesn't, that shouldn't mean that I should be like, oh, we shouldn't fight for rights or justice. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, it's like a re, I don't know, like further complexity of that. But uh, someone else should speak. I gobbled up a bunch of time there. Um, I mean, I also come from Mex I, I mean, I, I relate to what you're saying, and I also find it, but maybe like taking another, um, like, uh, like not so not to follow up on that, but to give another perspective. Yeah, I might also think of, um, and maybe also because of the text, like all of this makes a lot of noise in my head and lots of noise to me in general because I have been sick at some point in my life. And, uh, but then somehow I got better and for a while I have been okay. And I'm not okay, I'm fine. Like I'm quite fine. And uh, I don't even know exactly what I mean to say here, but there is, um, I don't know, just the, the thinking of what is considered an illness and what is not and how to speak from there when I am not there anymore, but I have been and, and I was not ready to speak about it. It isn't, it isn't making a difference, but I don't know, and also like just uh, I ha was never really diagnosed in general. They just thought it might have been connected, but then they never knew. So it there's also a possibility of something coming back. But I I uh, I I don't know. I just find myself sometimes thinking. But it is also oh two more minutes. Maybe I should stop. And, no, no. no. Uh, No, Joe, I think he's muted. I wasn't, I was just saying don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I am unsure what to add because also the idea of like grappling or coming to terms with something is I think just uh, constantly something which I'm doing or people are doing, especially nowadays where you're thinking about like, like she was saying, like our complicity, whether or not we like these things or our own position and also what you were saying about expectations on other people and thinking about like how we have like certain values and things and trying to um, put those into actions and ways that we live our lives. Whereas also at the same time, that's uh, difficult and not always practical or easy or something sorry my cat is on my lap um, <laughs> um yeah the 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 kind of like bargaining that you have to do with yourself um because also like, especially when you're talking about health and this kind of like physical bodies you also have to think about your energy and how much like you have to give to something and a lot of these things when we're talking about like white supremacy or when we're talking about like ableism and there's just so much to be done and so much work to be done. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, I think a lot of this has evidently shows like a tension between also individual and group and society, right? Like, like mm. the eternal thing about, you know, if I'm doing fine and I sort of want to protect myself, then I sort of have to hide, my, hide and not, uh, or, or how to speak for others when you can't or feel like you can't too. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's nice, several different uh, ways. I wonder what everyone else thought. It's such a nice word, grappling, grapple. <laughs> oh, we have 10 seconds. <laughs> Final thoughts, you have five seconds. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, everyone's smiling. <laughs> that was cool. Say more about that. <laughs> Just the coming back was cool. It is. It is. Uh, the conversation coming back is also cool, but the the conversation was a was a was a present with a bow on it. Yeah. What did you talk about? Yeah, I'm desperately jealous. I mean, not jealous, but like interested. Um, so I was talking with Laura Cox, um, who's working in the field of anthropology of dance. If I understand. And we talked about the yes and the no and how this could be translated into movement of resistance and acceptance. And we talked about hyper places and protest cultures and how things can be multiple things at the same time stacking and layering we talked about this in our practices yeah. and what's your practice show are you on i guess so um i'm i'm part of an artist group called tools for action ah. so we work with um we're experimenting at the moment with uh, ambiguous forms of protest so how can you protest the and and the also and the uh, alternative, the yes, the affirmative, and not only the no and against, and the narrowing. Um, you, I think we need the yes and the no, both, but we practice with the, the yes, especially. Yeah. So we're looking for um, modular forms of um, how can you like, create a place of highlighting ecological and racial and socioeconomic. It's like the intersectional, but what form can that take in protest cultures? That's what we're working on. Yeah. Gorgeous. Anyone else want to share stuff that came up on this? Or questions that emerged? So much easier talking when you're just four people, right? Yeah. <laughs> Malu, did you want to say something? We have two Malus. Ashley. I don't, I don't want to say anything else, and thanks for hosting. I think this was great. Yeah, thanks. I was going to say that we talked about um, or actually I brought up how it kind of like for me grappling is kind of how you mentioned or like from your text Alexis with living with complicity. So like grappling with your own way of being and how that may um, impact others harmfully and like harm that you don't see. So uh, yeah, that was something that I mentioned in our group of uh, grap grappling with complicity, honestly. Yeah. Hi. Um, we, in our group, we were talking, we had two independent curators, which is a bit of a rarity. So we were speaking a lot about um, the whole negotiation process of value making in, our, in ourselves and also in our work and those kind of boundaries. And I was saying how emotional I felt when you spoke about your world becoming smaller because you were trying to work with uh, disenfranchised or marginalized people in your in, in your department the students in your department and i really sort of empathized with that feeling in a sort of really small way about being in lockdown and just trying to think a lot more about my embodiment and my practice and, and me you know those connections so for me i found this social technology of grappling that eli claire was doing i was both grappling with a lot of the things he was saying my own sort of ethics and values and also his the things i didn't agree with and also this idea of grappling as a social technology right like how can i employ it so that's and we also ran out of time that's why i feel like we should say that <laughs> and who were you in a group with i was in a group with uh, yun who doesn't have her video on and irene hi oh, yeah. Anna, I saw you. 
yeah we i something that i have been thinking about a lot in terms of um so I first came across Alexis' work when I wrote a paper. I'm a master's student at the University of Amsterdam. When I wrote a paper about the notion of permeability, and I think that grappling is a really difficult concept for, like, not only to get your head around a little bit, but also to embody. Like, it's very much like having a, a single viewpoint, being sort of single-minded and not being multiple is something that is so celebrated not only in like the world of academia but also like the world that we live in and, and this idea of being resilient and sticking by your guns almost and i think this is really interesting like trying to embody multiple multi-different perspectives and, and viewpoints while acknowledging your own positionality is, is a really fruitful way especially coming from like gender studies where often there are multiple different strands of thought that are conflictory that don't always meet up with each other that don't sit together well um like i in recently uh did a summer school and we had some young like body positivity activists come in and um, do a presentation about what body positivity meant to them um and one of the questions was from a, a trans person who was in the audience who said well your your like rhetoric of be happy, love the body that you're in doesn't sit well with me because I was born in a body that I don't love and that's part of who I am and I'm never going to. And I think that although there was that was quite a tense exchange, the fact that it wasn't reconciled was actually quite productive. Um, and I don't see that there's going to be a neat conclusion there. And maybe that in itself is something to think about. I Oh, can you unmute? It's on the bottom left. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, and maybe to add to what Hannah just said, we also um, more generally had a bit of a conversation about um, grappling as an approach to theory as something that you also have to go back to over and over again and where you can find new stuff and where things don't always resolve again um, into, into a bite-sized kind of easy thing you can take away from it and so to think about grappling as an ongoing relational process um, was quite helpful for me so wonderful thank you all um, i'd like us to move into um, a, a break that's also a self self-reflection, self-conversation. Um, so for this part, I'd like us to take up um, some of that uh, sense that Hannah is raising, um, recognizing the spaces or times or inclinations when we actually do want to eradicate something or um, hold a boundary. So. Uh, one of the things that I've learned a lot from this idea of viscous porosity, which is a term that Nancy Tuana uses in thinking about uh, Superfund sites, which are places in the United States that they've designated just um, Sacrifice zones basically so so toxic that they're never going to be remediated um, That work uh, on recognizing that we're part of a world that we um, uh, take in, right? That any boundary is, uh, any border is also a site of movement, right? Um, and that there are various things that we're porous to without being able to um, control that. And, and then also there are things that we might um, wish to give up or eradicate that are, um, disavowed violences we have toward aspects of ourselves. Um, so I think for me, one of the things that I work with all the time is um, I have chemical sensitivities, which is this, uh, you know, means that I can be walking through uh, the department or have a student come into my office. And if they're wearing, I don't know if most of you are in Europe, I don't know if you have Axe body cologne there. People are some people are making sad nods. Yeah. So that like 
I can, if, if I take in certain scents or certain chemicals, I then become useless for my work. Like I get fuzzy headed. I can't articulate. I lose words. I, you know, so all of the things that make me the kind of person that I, um, I mean, I'm working on this in therapy, but where the things that make me feel like I'm worth existing, right? Because I can be quick and capture, you know, understand those things go, I lose them. Um, so that's a form of porosity that I want to eradicate, right? Like if I could be around any dryer sheet, uh, perfume, um, oil, and not get sick, I, there's a part of me that I definitely would. So in this um, little gap, we'll take, um, let's say we, we'll take until 6.05 um, for, so in about eight minutes. Um, what I invite you to do is move around. So actually like do move your body and um, touch some part of your body, hold it, uh, that, or something in your world that um, comes up for you as a grappling. So if you're like, a fat positive person who wishes to get rid of your belly, um, try holding your belly. Don't do something that's going to make you, you know, hurt yourself, right? Like don't, don't re-inscribe a trauma that you're working with. You know what you can do and what you can't do. I'm not going to go next door and breathe in the dryer sheets that are happening on the laundry. So, but just um, move your body and do it in a way that you're holding in some way something that causes you to grapple with the ideology of cure, um, or just go get some tea and use the washroom and just move a little bit. And we'll come back at about 6.05.
So coming out of that, um, are there any specifics of Eli Claire? It, this is, it's just impossible. This is an impossible thing for, like I was just realizing like, oh, we haven't looked at any particular quotes from Claire or, um, but we're gonna move into shortly into thinking about Mel Chen. So anything that anyone wants to say about that experience or um, about Eli Claire's work um, or any questions that are coming up that we can try to help each other with. Yeah, Evie. Or Evie. Um, it's not necessarily to do with the ideology of cure, but I think um, Hannah raised a really interesting point that at least on an individual level, rather than maybe like uh, community level, it's easier to understand the idea of grappling, I think, through gender. Um, because I was thinking, yeah, when you were talking about like maybe holding part of the body, I was like, oh, I recently shaved my legs because now it's warm outside and they're so smooth and it's great. <laughs> and there's this grappling between feeling pleasure from, I don't know, succeeding in forms of femininity that are not necessary, they're not actually productive to any, you know, my daily life, but doing, you know, putting makeup on or, or kind of, yeah, being perceived as, as feminine is almost a good thing. And then grappling with the idea that this is not, uh, yeah, it's, it's not important in the grand scheme of things and it shouldn't be important to your, necessarily to your sense of self. Um, and I think, yeah, that's how I kind of understand this idea of, of grappling. One of my friends wrote his uh, thesis on the idea of whether non-binary identities kind of devalue or um, kind of deconstruct the idea of, of uh, trans identities, kind of like um, a single gender. Um, and I think it's it's interesting that there there really isn't a conclusion. There there's no way to uh, yeah to have kind of one mindset about that. So that's how I, I started thinking about grappling just just in the break. Thank you. I, I think throughout reading Claire's work and also during this exercise, um, it becomes very personal and therefore also felt like because he's bringing in his lived experience, it challenges you to get on that level, like because of the language that he uses, um, it automatically challenges you like right at that moment to, I think for me, um, just staying in that personal vein, like uh, family members with disability, um, how have I dealt with that? And the pain that you go through as a family um, and the grappling with cure you go through as a family um, and how that might have felt for them uh, being sort of reduced to a disability but also the, um, yeah, without jumping into sort of like the stigma of like the super, super crip um, terminology, but also how their particular disabilities have created uh, collective experiences for you, like personal experiences, um, dealing with people with like chronic pain that you would, you wish you could take away from them because it's awful experiencing that, but you're also maybe getting closer. Um, so it's like, it, it, it really brought up like, yeah, I was like bawling my eyes out reading this thing. And I felt like it was really like sitting like so deeply. And I think that's also due to the style of writing, like it, it really grabs you by the balls. So I don't know if other people had this kind of visceral experience of grappling. 
Um, Emily. Yeah, actually, it's not really my personal experience, but more about like when I was also reading the text. Um, I also kind of have this really strong feeling of how before I was perceiving other people's body and how can I reconceptualize or reconsider um, our definition of a normal or um, cured body in a way, particularly in one of the section when he was talking about this um, separation of conjoined twins. And because one of my artist friend um, in Taiwan was recently, um, he he did a work on like the first um, successfully um, separated conjoined twins in Taiwan, and he kind of um, revisited the his this history and interviewed um, one of the the twins because the other um, suffered from um, the separation and then eventually died. And um, it was really interesting when he interviewed um, uh, the person and he talked about how he also felt this sense of lost and actually an experience of death um, later on um, multiple in multiple different um, yeah, situations. And um, it really echoes actually what um, Ellie was also writing in this um, paragraph when um, people were talking about, wow, these, um, they're truly individuals um, now and before they are not, but actually, how do we really think about um, individuality when um, the person itself feels not himself anymore when um, they're separated? And I think that was kind of also really um, yeah, and a sense of, yeah, re-experiencing our um, own um, preconception in a way. Thank you. Does anybody else have any, uh, yeah, Lao? Um, so I, I might have missed a part in, in the reading uh, because I, I read only two of the three chapters of Claire. Um, but I was wondering, um, in in thinking about disability, um, I sometimes wonder, um, you know, instead of the either or, like either you're disabled or you're not, um, and then even recognizing you know, uh, there are these different models about um, to kind of conceive of disability and, uh, and the, the social model where, you know, it's, 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 it's society and the way that it structures that disables you. It is not you who are disabled, it's the society that is disabling mm -hmm. um, and renders you not able basically to to kind of function in this space um social and physical but i'm wondering if if um and i have a term in in, in french but i don't know what it is, would be in english but um in terms of um i'm thinking more in terms of also in, in terms of mental mental health mm -hmm. um um and it's called what is it again it's what is it in french uh or maybe it's in English, but it's basically the idea of diversity, the idea that it's not that it's either normal or not normal, is that there is like a spectrum mm -hmm. um, and that um, there are just different ways of being. Um, and, 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 and it's interesting also because I worked in, in psychiatry and, and in French psychiatry and um, and U.S. psychiatry, for example, well, the importance of the, the, the diagnostic manual, the DSM, mm -hmm. and how uh, it kind of has this, this uh, importance for the entire world of psychiatry worldwide, but how um, in, in, in different places, what is considered normal or abnormal is different. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's both this, this thing of, you know, it's all about how you define normal, but then there's this other thing about you maybe, maybe there's just diversity. There's mm -hmm. just a diversity of ways of being. 
um, and um, yeah, so th that's something I'll, and I, I didn't feel like I found those um, types of thought in Claire's text, but maybe I, I missed because I, I didn't read the third plate, the third chapter. So. And I, indeed, the third chapter is the nuancing. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> oh, no, there's still time to read it. <laughs> I, I really recommend that one. Um, Danny? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have a sort of question. Uh, because Hannah and also Ruby brought up this thing of unresolvability, something mm -hmm. that I resolved in the text for me was this, you know, I creatively really got into the way that Claire uses sort of mind-body dualisms, his talk of the American prairie and relating restoration to his own disability or how to restore restore the body. Um, and all of these kind of, and I saw these really as spaces of grappling. But when he spoke about Christopher Reeve, I really thought that he adopted a completely different language, like a stuckness to him. Like yeah. because he really couldn't work, like experience himself outside of his own, both sort of ableism and white privilege. Like how? I just, I felt really conflicted there because I almost felt sorry for Christopher Reeve, you know, because I don't know, it just made me think a lot about movement and this fluidity and porosity that we came, we spoke about last, uh, last time and yeah. um, for us all in our work, it kind of almost reinstates a different border between people that don't think like that. It's like we're in a bubble. I don't know. Does anyone understand what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of working through it as I'm saying it. Adam, did you want to reply to that? Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I, f I felt um, I felt that like when I was reading the Christopher Reeve part, just because it felt um, like I understood the kind of um, the pain or difficulty in being confronted with the figure the instrumentalized figure of Christopher Reeve, like, of course, like, sort of, yeah, ableist, inspirationalist, like, rhetoric being instrumentalized, like, through Christopher Reeve. At the same time, like, the comments of, like, yeah, he's just a white privileged man, like, I found it very dismissive and very, like, fixating. Um, so it kind of, like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I found it like a bit sort of, it disrupted the text. But what I appreciated about, about Claire's writing was, yeah, there is a sense of honesty and a sense of like a very complicated uh, and personal honesty um, uh, between his own experience, uh, his experience of, of his friends um, and of people who are not so much his friends. <laughs> um, and I guess I appreciated the style of the text, like uh, sort of, yeah, to be able to be uh, vulnerable enough to be honest. Um, and yeah, I, to also go on uh, with that, this point of like fixating others who we may not uh, agree with. Um, yeah, I think, thinking about the question of like what would you eradicate of yourself or if you what what have you been tempted to eradicate um i was thinking about it and a thing that i've like always been like struggling wrestling grappling with uh is is definitely concepts of race um especially yeah especially ones that are fixating and i'm not necessarily talking about like like I wouldn't eradicate race in order for myself to be like white, for instance, but rather to eradicate the concept <laughs> uh, as a child, uh, race as a child of whiteness. <laughs> um, uh, just, but, but I also recognize that it's like, it's very complicated because I, I have friends um, who get a lot of what their identity is from uh, clinging to ideas around race or reclamations of ideas around race. Um, and I wouldn't want to take that away from them. Um, 
and yeah it's just really complicated <laughs> like uh thinking like i would rather not live in a world where i had to explain myself along lines of color um but also that recognizing that that may give strength to some people um in a different in a variety of ways um but the thing that came up in the in the breakout session before was like yeah uh, the kind of politics of decision making that each decision has its consequences each thing that you want might hurt someone else each thing that you don't want um might hurt someone else or erase someone else um and trying to make sense of that <laughs> um yeah yeah and i think that's such an important point around um we'll never be able to say all of our reasons for what we want and they won't ever be simple um but being able to have a little bit more of a why we want the world to be one way or another so thinking about race how do we capture something that is you know, at root violent in every way, but that um, also out of that violence, people have crafted lives and beautiful lives. So there's an Asian Dub Foundation song that has a like quote called Committed to Life as a quote from Asada Shakur. And she says, I, you know, I wish I had been born into a world in which it was unnecessary to struggle. Um, I'm a reluctant warrior, I'm a reluctant struggler. You know, these are all the things I could have, could have been. But she says, but at this point, the only way to live on this earth with any human dignity at the moment is to struggle. And so there's something there about like, what does it mean to, I mean, that's another way of thinking about grappling, right? Like, what if one of the things we love is, our, is about ourselves and each other, is what we've had to be and become in order to meet the violence of this world? Um, yeah, and I mean, one of the things that I didn't, well, on the Christopher Reeve part, um, I, I, one of the things I think is interesting is, I think he's doing an imminent critique of his own narration of Christopher Reeve. So on, on page 13, he says, um, one day in my work as an activist writer, I met a podium debunking lies about disability and cure, ranting yet again about Reeve. I pause, look at the audience, and see my friend P standing at the back of the room. Her story of surviving cancer, surgery, chemo, radiation, her brush with death flashes through me. All at once, my words feel like empty rhetoric. I have no idea what cure means to her. Um, and for me, like thinking about the sort of piercingness, I just, I have so many friends right now that have, well, I have four friends right now who have stage four cancer, and I desperately want them to be cured, you know. And there's a piece that I didn't have us read. So if you're curious about this, the book is all available on the Duke website right now, um, or you know, it's a good book to just buy and own. Um, but in the section called At the Center of Cure, there's a section about schizophrenia where Claire talks about his own experience of schizophrenia. And it's extremely complicated and um, rich and thought provoking. Um, so, and also it was something that I was like, I don't know what people's experiences of schizophrenia in this group are, and I want everyone to have an option of reading that or not, but I recommend it to you um, in terms of a lot of what everyone has said. We have to move on because we were supposed to spend 10 minutes talking about Chen. So this is one of these experiences of time being a problem. Um, can, is that okay? Can we move into Chen? I, I just wanted to make sure I, I saw Malou. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, also wanted to say something. No, it's it's okay. Let's just move on. I have so many reactions and thoughts in my <laughs> at the moment from you all have been saying. So I will just be blabbling anyway. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do this sort of. I'm gonna do a short thing about Claire about Chen, and then we'll do breakout groups, which is sad for all of us because we can't hear the brilliant things that everyone else says, but we can at least have some time for yes. this conversation. So it's going to yes. happen in a moment. Um, 
So is it helpful for me to just say uh, some of the sort of key concepts that I wanted to offer from Chen? Um, okay. So I think um, the three key things that I that I have um, grappled with in Chen are um, the question of animacy and animacy hierarchies, uh, the way that Chen thinks and talks about toxins, and, um, and then this question that is very unresolved for me about what they call an ulterior ethical stance might be. So, um, so very quickly, um, in linguistics, um, and in lots of other disciplines, one of the things that's really useful that Chen does is to say, we can tell something about how a social world constitutes who is worth, worthy of regard by looking at where they sit in a scale of being um, recognized as having life, as being animate. So where the highest form in the conventional scale is being a um, human being who has the capacity to reason. So animacy scales are densely interwoven with uh, enlightenment conceptions of who counts as being fully human um, and how that's distributed. So this is talked about in lots of different ways, who has a full soul, who, who can own someone else, who can be owned, um, who has personhood, um, but animacy as a way to name that. And one of the things, so, so hierarchies of animacy are hierarchies of affect, who is worthy of care, worthy of regard. Um, and obviously they don't actually track life, right, in all of its complexity. Um, so the complicated things that are happening when we try to, or do give personhood or recognize personhood in a river or an ecosystem, those things, when we do them, are part of grappling with or transforming what's going to count as personhood or life. Um, so I, there's lots more that we could say about animacy, and that might be a way to, to think through. For me, I'm thinking a lot right now about, um, so viruses are really complicated in terms of animacy and how we think and talk about them, because they're not technically alive, but they have profound effects. So sometimes hierarchies of animacy are also based on who has the power to affect someone else. So I find Chen's work on animacy structures and the complexities of animacy, for me, much more useful than a lot of the, um, the kind of like um, vibrant matter, Dane Bennett style stuff. Like I find this much more usable than um, some of the material, um, anyway, bracket. Uh, so, Animacy one cluster, second cluster, toxins. So the normal semantic and sort of structural idea is that um, the dose makes the poison and that there's a like a toxic um, contaminating thing that comes up against something that is um, uncontaminated, pure, innocent, and it merges with it or it contaminates it. So Chen is one of the people who really thinks about like what happens if we start from the idea that toxicity is our basic condition, that we're just enmeshed in interpenetration, and then we can start to ask what happens next? What bodies bear the friction of interpenetration? Um, what bodies bear the fiction? What bodies can enact the idea that they're independent and uninterrupted? Um, how is that distribution of toxicity a political thing. Um, and so this is the way that they think about toxins is so complicated and interesting because they both are saying there isn't such a thing as non-toxic that doesn't exist. And they're saying also people should have much more power to determine what they're exposed to and how they're transformed and by what. So the chapter right before this one is about lead and um, lead paint on toys and a, a sort of um, thing that happened where a bunch of toys from China had lead on them and there was a big uproar and and so this chapter is about mercury toxicity and metal as a um, malleable making labial um, experience. 
So then they have this concept of an ulterior ethical stance, which is the third thing I wanted to offer. So an ulterior ethical stance is somehow um, stepping beside, like standing alongside something, um, not uh, promulgating a fiction of mastery or impermeability, um, fixed boundaries, but starting from um, being implicated, what does it look like to still make decisions based on um, based on that instead of the idea that we aren't implicated or don't have to be. So the ulterior as inside and still a space for ethical regard. So we thought we could do another 10 minute breakout, but yes, yeah, this so one one thing that I was really uh, thinking about when I was reading the text is the question of, of affect and intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was in school, affect was like thrown around indiscriminately, and I always tried to understand what it meant, and it seemed to mean different things to different uh, people. So I was really curious about like, yeah, there is like sort of like a a sensuousness uh, to the way that they are describing toxicity and being intoxicated and then bringing that together with this idea of like queer intimacy um, and I think it would be helpful for me to to get your sort of like thoughts on, on what you think affect encompasses in this yeah so um, there's a number of different kind of um, lineages of thinking about affect so, um, so for the affect studies, people that are sort of um, coming out of like Deleuze and Guattari, uh, like Spinoza, um, Brian Musumi, there's a pretty strong, so I'm just throwing those names out in case anyone that sparks for you, you don't have to know them or just know, there's a, a line of thinking about affect that says, an affect is an inchoate, unnamed, experience without clear boundaries and an emotion is uh, when we have a way to put a, a boundary around that um, so uh, so that's a whole sort of trajectory um, then there's a whole bunch of people that come more out of marxist aesthetics so the idea that um, one of the core things we're grappling with is the feeling of being alienated from our own productive capacity. So that everything we um, make is something that we monetize. Um, and then there's like complicated, interesting sort of intersections with psychoanalysis and how that recognition structure um, sets us up to be subjectifying ourselves towards something in order to have um, recognition. And so, um, some of those folks which come out of um, Kant's third critique of judgment, um, Schiller, Marcuse, Avery Gordon, um, to some extent Stuart Hall, some of those things are really working in the space of saying um, the approach that we can take toward um, how we feel in the world tells us something of um, what the structure, political and social structure of the world is. And then I would say there's this other grouping that for me I access through Eve Sedgwick mostly, um, which is coming from psychoanalytic work. Um, uh, and, and I think that I would place Mel Chen in that sort of basic um, uh, conversation or bucket. And, um, and also someone that um, was one of my teachers who I recommend because I don't think she's read enough, uh, Sue Campbell. So these are people who, who look at what it means for the structures of intelligibility that we have in the world to be, and yeah, also Sarah Ahmed. Yeah, I would, I would put actually Ahmed also in the sort of Sedgwick, Campbell, um, Chen conversation. Um, so that the political and social structures that we have to interpret and understand our world shape in some way who and what we can be in relation to the world. So that affect turns out not to be something that's like 
um, politically irrelevant and we just need to like have good arguments, but actually it's at the center of what we're doing and trying to create a world in which many, to echo the Zapatistas, in which many worlds can live. Um, so I think when Chen is thinking about animacies and queer affect, one of the things that they're interested in is what happens when we create spaces and worlds in which affects that aren't currently recognized as existing exist, and then we exist because they exist. Also, like Anne Svetkovich, I think, is in that same sort of on the Chen. Um, and, and then there's some really interesting, complicated stuff that's happened since affect studies has sort of like moved out of vogue. So like I, um, well, Anne Svetkovich just moved a couple of years ago to Carleton. So we've been having these reading groups and we were just reading um, the new book by Sayed, Sayida Hartman um, called Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiment. And um, so there's something else happening that's like, because affect studies existed and then people moved on, there's this whole work that's going on in black feminism right now that I think um, is very cool in terms of the reclamation of Sylvia Winter or the like reinvigoration of thinking and talking with her, um, Catherine McKintrick, Sylvia Hartman. Yeah, sorry, that was super long. And but I, I think useful because it's so like, uh, at the center of the text and was is one of the most difficult uh, terms I think uh, in there. But yeah, let's let's do the the breakout rooms again. And um, is that okay with anyone? Is that anyone having a burning question? And I promise not to talk for seven minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, Jean, can we break? Everybody clear with the breakout rooms? All right. All right, sorry, I was managing the barricade rooms again. <clears throat> Hello again. What, what are we supposed to? Um, the question is, uh, what toxins or intoxicants do we welcome for ourselves and which do we impose on others? Yeah, okay. Um, one of the things that it was making me think of, I don't know if people have read um, Test, Test, Testo Junkie um, by Paul Preciado, but where they talk about, um, they talk about like uh, how lot, like there's like a huge public discourse where people don't like the idea of messing with your hormones or like, you know, like, um, hormone replacement therapy and like transitioning which like whereas a lot for like er in every day there's like women taking like the pill so it's just like a very standard thing and so like on that kind of logic you're saying that women who take the pill like are in some way trans or in some way like yeah I, I don't know there's I, I think it's uh I think what I, what I, what it was making me think is that like when we think of like toxins or things which aren't natural it has a real there's like it, it really depends on what the context is so like whether i'm given something by my doctor or whether for like a purpose which i agree with compared to like something people don't agree with like it really isn't necessarily about what is the toxin but also like like the social cultural reason around it as well, I guess, is what, yeah. So yeah, so that, that was just a spiel. I finished speaking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a super interesting point. Okay. 
I mean, that's um, hmm. uh, during the last session we we were talking a lot about yeah thinking like toxins going through um, going through bodies you know and I remember I had very clear thoughts then <laughs> not so much now. Uh, But there's a bit, for, for example, that com comes a lot to mind. Uh, uh, also, because we were just uh, talking about the cancer bit in the clear text, um, where you know chemotherapy is basically also poisoning your body in order to poison something else mm. that grew out of you too. Uh, so the the degree of things that you think negatively of. It's interesting because the cancer you basically grew yourself, even though there's a chance that you know it, it started growing because of outside uh, external sources, other toxins coming in. Uh, even though the the basis of cancer is that uh, it's oxidation basically. Um, so there's this interesting, uh, you know, the different levels of, of of dealing with toxicity. You know, because it's not really about that. It's about the, the, the perfect state of our cells that we aim for. Um, the, like just today, I noticed I have a, a mole that was not there before. Uh, and now I have to you know, keep track of how it's growing uh, because it could be, in my family, there's a lot of skin cancer. Um, but then, there, I, I don't know, if, in the end, there's also something here about for example, with people going through chemo, they have to admit this thing that will basically also destroy them uh, in order to possibly extend their lifespan or, or go past this one uh, illness. And, and the one taboo that I keep seeing in last week's, week's text and this text is, the, you know, the, the grappling with dead and, and the possibility of, of also accepting that uh, when necessary, um, it, which is still, I, I don't know, for me, it's one of the biggest taboos, but anyways, um, I may be drifting away. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, a, it's a good point. It kind of shows how, how arbitrary the idea of like what is natural and unnatural because yeah also it's something like a mole or a tumor is, is your body is producing it but then it's um yeah there's something not quite right about it um as well and it's a question of what are you determining as a, as a toxin basically mm. or, or, yeah how are you i also think it's a good question of um not what you're accepting into your body but also like what are you trying to get rid of yeah that's interesting and, and because also part of the question is what kind of toxins do we, do we impose on others mm. and that's where yeah like uh, my parents are doctors my mom had cancer and, and i've seen several situations in which uh, uh my grandmother died of cancer actually and and at some point she was also saying like i'm i'm old i know i have this and you know it's gonna be I, I i don't want to go through the whole process i'm fine with dying now which was really at a wind house but you know there was this force of everyone saying like no 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 you get better uh mm. let's 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 do this uh fortunately positive measures won and she didn't get anything but i have seen several cases of people really pushing for uh, no, no, you get the, you get this uh, chemo. I mean, and it goes back to a stupid as it is, like the vaccine, the, the vaccine situation. Um, and related to last week's text, the, the way that purity is sort of expected in all levels of, so of individuals and society. Once I see you very thoughtful. <laughs> I am just uh, I have no idea how to what I am not sure what to say or what to give but I just uh, think of 
of how this porousness it it is it, implicit that things are no oh, oh my god um uh oh, i i am not sure what to give to you right now <laughs> i uh, i don't know i just have this in front of me this uh from the Chen text, uh, the question then becomes which bodies can bear the fiction of independence and uninterruptibility? But I know, I, <laughs> I am sorry, I, I cannot put things together at the moment. But, <laughs> but yeah, I guess that, that question would link to something, say like the, the vaccine argument that some people uh, are seeing their bodies as as separate and individual enough to then say, well, I don't want to be contaminated, or I don't want my children's bodies to be contaminated with with a vaccine. When the question is more about the the community body being vaccinated from a larger threat again, is the like the the rhetoric is, is very much like fear based, but. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about that a lot as well, especially in terms of then we discussed that kind of similarly in the last group and then reading the Claire text and having this idea of uh, body mind rather than just uh, just body, which I thought was, was good. But uh, for example, in the other texts, the other text example of the vaccine, like the the man that was saying that he was not going to put his uh, children through the vaccine had like an argument on on them being uncorrupted oh, like yeah. it was a sense of them he thinking them per impermeable of absolutely mm. everything on on touched in a way when it it's simply not like that and I'm gonna stop speaking because I cannot. <laughs> be that's a, a, yeah, that's a good point. But, uh, I don't, I just I was just thinking like it's so hard to come to terms with a mesh and, and with 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 all this, especially because I and I think in Chen's text it was at some point it said like you you become the toxin, you become what can infect others as well in some situations. I don't know. I just feel that is quite um, clear, like clear right now. How you don't want to go and see your parents because you might be the toxin. Yeah. Or this. I, I, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Also, the idea of of key workers. It's like they're obviously they're necessary for certain jobs but then it's also like giving people a pass and saying okay well you can deal with the risk of being infected rather than you know someone else who who has the ability to work from home and is therefore protected but there's certain jobs that the government is saying well no you need to take the risk because yeah you're uh, yeah i don't know <laughs> difficult <laughs> yeah. yeah chen was chen was more complicated <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, just funny to sorry. Yeah, no go. Just to see how sometimes you 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 become porous in order to have an uh, an imagination of impermeability again. Oh, and you get a call and suddenly you can read and you're like, oh my god, this is bedrock. So they're gonna have to use the really like the really big like good 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 good. Um, it hasn't started yet, but it's going to be awful. And I'm guessing that's going to take ages. 
I think it's going to take the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Welcome, welcome back, all of you. Uh, I got so much work. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so much work gonna, outside of my house. Um, I think one of the things that we're discovering around the Plastic Hyper 3 reading room is that, um, like the, when we were getting ready for Danny's hosting session last time, we were like, oh, it's going to be, people are going to get really tired and not want to talk for more than like an hour, maybe an hour and a half at the outside. And, um, and what we find is that actually there's just tremendous exuberance and never enough time. Never enough time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just do a quick temperature test on, um, do we want to go over time a little bit? Do we want to still end promptly in nine minutes? Um, if we want to go over time, we would take maybe a break. We can, I think my sense is maybe we'll just stay and regather, but I want people, I, I like having to being able to close in a way that's like we're close, not dribbling out. I think we could say maybe that um, us from the organizing team could stay a little longer. I, I'm, we, we actually didn't discuss it, so I don't want to... Uh, um <laughs> catch anybody but whoever would want to stay for for another 20 minutes or so maybe we can stay behind and then whoever needs to go make their dinner or i know in taiwan for instance it's pretty oh, yeah. late so thank you so much for <laughs> sticking it out um yeah it's, if that's okay and and uh and and i think anybody during that time can like go and take a break uh, including you alexis <laughs> Okay, so what we'll do is we'll have a we'll have a contingent close at um, in eight minutes as planned, and then we'll have another ten minutes for just conversation. So let's let's do any um, anything that came up that you'd like to share from those discussions, um, or any questions that um, you did. Hi there. So can you hear me? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, actually we, we, I mean, we touched upon the text as well, uh, but for instance, I didn't read it fully. So we kind of shared our experiences of like being quarantined and how different notions of toxicity are in relation to that. And what I brought up is this, uh, on the one hand, one of the experiences that I, I spoke with a friend who's working in, an, in a working environment that she describes as toxic and how that, shifts with this new kind of way of like working together and being together but the but the thing we spoke about is this idea of digital detox which is kind of a fashionable like buzzword but uh, how that relates to different other notions of toxicity and um like what do we think about that and what kind of a, is that a bodily experience what what kind of toxicity is that and and yeah if what's what's the relation of of this idea of like closing out certain things that we refer to as toxic mm -hmm. and yeah these kinds of issues yeah lovely any other thoughts still brimming after the uh breakout rooms Well, it's funny because we were actually uh, uh, in the middle of a conversation when we had to break back out. So it was like, <gasps> <laughs> you can continue um, now. We're just a bit more. Um, but we, we were discussing this, um, the individual body and the collective body, I guess, mm -hmm. so the way in which uh, we, we tend to see or would like to see ourselves as independent, but in so many ways, our current condition in this pandemic makes clear more than ever that we are interdependent in many different ways um, to different degrees of course in different ways but um, the um, perceiving I guess the question I would like to discuss is uh, what does it um, mean to perceive ourselves as a collective body then in terms of behavior or um, how um, 
yeah, in terms of care for, uh, for ourselves and others to, to think of ourselves as multi-species and connected in these ways. How does that influence the way, we, the decisions we make, the things we do? And um, Yeah, I think this, this pandemic has really made it so, so clear that social distancing is actually, for many people, not necessarily something you do for yourself. Um, it's something you do for an abstract other. And I think um, it's been a long time since we've practiced that at this scale as humans. Mm -hmm. Anna? Um, I, I think this really speaks to, uh, I've kind of I've been working a long day, so it's, bear with me a moment, but Judith Butler has this book called Precarious Life, and I think she pertains to some of the ideas that you're talking about there in terms of like, this virus is kind of making us come to terms with the fact that our bodies are in, inherently inf infallible, in, inherently vulnerable and susceptible to damage. And that's something that like, states uh don't want to acknowledge right um which is very problematic when it comes to viruses um i'm not sure where i was going to go with that but like i think precarity in this virus seems so um inherently interwoven and for me like this kind of discourse about like the the virus is is reducing us to all the same conditions like it's not like some bodies are more vulnerable than others some bodies are more precarious than others and i think that needs to be acknowledged too i don't know if anyone wants to carry on from that i was also thinking about um shiloh's point of the collective body and also yeah, at once we realize how interdependent we are, but also I've really felt how the virus separates you so much with, especially with like 1.5 meter distancing and like how you miss certain random intimacies or planned intimacies of like seeing friends and close friends where it shuts you off in a way of like choosing who, whose body do I want to be um, whose body do I want to be with and how it kind of and also thinking of like protesting and gathering like that and the way it's decollectivizing as it collectivizes at the same time like it collectivizes us separately and also shuts down certain intimacies and uh, moments for our bodies to be porous to each other in a way so I feel like that's also, uh, yeah, something I think about with like the collective body in this time. Yeah. Did you pick up on Hannah's point? Hannah, I don't know where you're based. I'm in Glasgow. Are you in the UK? Um, I am British, but I live in Amsterdam. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so it's, it, picking up on your point, I've not read um, Precarious Life, but in terms of like vulnerability and vulnerable body. Um, uh, it came out in the news the other day here that if you're a person of color, you're five times more likely to die from COVID in the UK. Um, so is that what you mean, sort of a differential vulnerability? We were more vulnerable to virus. Well, that's kind of how I took it. And there's this weird kind of backlash that I'm really experiencing in my own sort of circles, because in the UK, people are really flagrantly like not ad adhering to lockdown rules. Like everyone is out, like they're in a, they're more, there's more than two people hanging out. There's like garden parties and I pass on the other day. And, um, and I started to think about that as a form of toxic behavior and trying to compare that sort of toxicity versus the sort of vulnerability of bodies to viruses. That's kind of what I picked up from what you were saying. We were also uh, talking about in our group this uh, part from Chen's text where they talk about um, immunity as having become something individualized and personalized, whereas maybe earlier in history it was um, seen more as like a collective thing or as something from the outside versus the inside, um, which I think also is, is, is something that 
we're coming to terms with now, like the ideas of um, herd immunity. Um, and then in that question, the, the, the losses that are part of that sort of strategy. And then, well, I think everybody in, in the end kind of bailed on that idea, but I think when I read that, that part, I was thinking a lot about, and we were also discussing in, in our breakout room, like this idea of like my body as being mine, whereas um, we of course are a certain amount of kilos of uh, microbiome and germs and uh, we're, we're mostly just like a host for uh, um, a lot of other microbes. Um, yeah, that was, that was my two cents. A little bit ago, I saw Malu um, Softfield. You had something? Um, oh, yeah, but it get, yeah, there's, there's so many things. But maybe I can briefly tell you there was a question for, about how to behave as a collective body. I thought, like, even though we are different bodies and some are more vulnerable than others. Um, yeah, I still think that we have to consider that as maybe our arms are more vulnerable than our feet or whatever. So we, we're still one body, you know, we have to. But I went on um, another reading group uh, some weeks ago and for the introduction, everyone had to tell which plant they connect to home. So, and that was like 20, 30 people or something. And everyone was like talking about this plant in their home or whatever they had in mind. And then when this was all done, the host said, thank you so much for sharing. This, is, uh, this was an exercise in becoming forest. And I thought that was so beautiful. That was a beautiful way to start, but this is also about a collective body, you know, like becoming something to, and I feel that's what we're doing right now um, as well. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah, an overstory. And I, are folks familiar with Natasha Myers' work? Was that the Becoming Sensor project? Um, I can text it. It's, it's beautiful in terms of that um, sense of being. Yeah, actually, um, you mentioned two books, also one, another one. Um, and I was going to write it down, but then, uh, yeah, maybe you could, you could put that okay. in the chat. That would be amazing. So, and we're at, um, we're at the hour. So anyone who wants to stay, um, you're welcome to stay and we can keep talking and anyone who wants to go, this is, you can just go, but it's been so, thank you so much for sharing and being here and experiencing the, um, you know, the frustration of not being able to completely merge. <laughs> By the way, regarding the chat, do you recall? Uh, do you do you share that at some point? Because as soon as the Zoom closes, you can't find all these links again. Oh, really? Okay, yes. that's, a, if you that's can, a good point. Or maybe you can find them, but we can't because we can't insert the Zoom. I copied them to my notes. <laughs> so if anyone wants notes, I can take them. Maybe we can ask Jean to send or Ashley to send them. Send them yeah. out. Yeah, I think we can send any any links uh, to the to everyone who participated. So yeah, it's okay. fine. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think we also forgot to mention just like a very practical detail, or maybe actually you mentioned, but that it was being recorded. So in case oh, yeah. somebody wouldn't want their face or voice recorded, then they should uh, let Ashley or Chang know. Right. Right. Yeah. Maybe you already said it and I forgot it, but no. Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't said. It wasn't said. So, um, but that also means you can go back and listen again um, and, and write down all the golden nuggets. Um, I know I'm going to do that because I <laughs> didn't take any notes. <laughs> Thank you so much also from my end. Um, I'm going to stick around for a bit also. Say hi to friends, um, to new friends. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, Alexis. It's been just like such a pleasure working with you and getting to know your work and your world. So thank you. 
All right. Well, I guess this is uh, the people that are sticking behind. So <laughs> make it sound so uh, so official. <laughs> It's really <sighs> funny, Malu, that you mentioned this other reading group because I was also part of that. Um, and yeah. it's really <laughs> funny to like see people in like totally different reading groups. And yeah. Yeah. You know, it was funny because after that reading group, I also received a text on Instagram from someone who said that she was listening to a podcast and then she recognized the voice and it was my voice and she recognized that voice from this reading group. So it all kind of and then she took part in the podcast after all. Wow. But it's, uh, yeah. Nice. Malou, but hey, I nice. also want to uh, plug your your uh, your podcast reading. Sorry? Maybe you also want to plug your podcast slash reading group. Yeah. You're all invited for the podcast reading group if you want. <laughs> yes, that's also. And, and the first episode was called something about a shared body. I think it was... It was being at home in your body and the planet as a shared body and a common home, I think, was the title. So, and, and then we actually read um, Sick Woman Theory. You know that? Yeah. It's a bit aggressive, but I think it's really well. And it's a lot about productivity, which is something we discussed today in the first breakout room. I think it was Emily. Are you still here? Um, who mentioned uh, the body and the, the whole ex uh, expectations of them um, as a woman being a production tool and you have to produce babies. That was for your first question, Alexis, and I can't remember what it was, but about grappling, I guess. And yeah. So I think productivity is a, is a urgent question. In terms of being able or disabled, like what is it actually we're able to, to, to produce or what are, you know, who gets to decide that? I just shared also, um, Carrie Higgins is a, a US artist who I think gets, um, does not get enough credit um, or recognition. Um, she does this incredible work about um, epilepsy and having a kink in her spinal cord and she um, <laughs> she does things like she makes her own ink from the pollution in Salt Lake City and makes forgeries it's like just incredible work about and she has also some just amazing theoretical work so I think folks will love her too I also Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to say I, I put the lecture by Joanna Hedfer of Sick Woman Theory into the into the chat. Whoever whoever wants to, I really recommend it. It's a very moving lecture. Oops. Thank you, Zoom, for telling me that I was muted. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking about something that Alexis mentioned in the beginning, but then we forgot to talk about it, which was this concept of becoming indicator species. And I have like a selfish, a selfish stake in that because I'm also interested in these and kind of like slowly writing applications about it. And I just wanted to talk about it. Like, what do you think that could mean? Like, are we already indicator species? Um, are certain people more indicator species than others? I'm also thinking about there's an artist collective called the Canaries that um, an acquaintance of mine has been part of, I think. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I think it was like it, it ties in with like the, the question of like responsibility that that you're talking about in your text, Alexis and. Yeah, I was just really curious how that that term kind of like maybe sparked some some thoughts in people's minds or bodies. Yeah, I have a friend who is someone who is in the same um, grad program as me. So very, you know, uh, like accomplished person. Um, gave up a tenure track job because she experiences multiple chemical sensitivity, which I know, you know, experience myself. 
And also she has reactions to electricity, wireless networks, modems. Um, and on Facebook, she's really forwarding this idea that uh, the flu and the coronavirus are electrical diseases. And I've been looking at my own rejection of my own complete and utter rejection of that as a proposition, um, right? Like I just don't think that's true. Um, I think a virus exists and I think, um, so she and other people who, but I've met also, she's not the only person I know who is articulating themselves as having a reaction to 5G, right? So like all of these conspiracy theories that are making people burn down cell phone towers, you know, they are often articulating themselves like we are the canaries in the coal mine just because you don't experience the ill effects of electricity doesn't mean that our felt experience is wrong. And so also like thinking about the grappling um, question, I've been really like, what would it look like for me to take this seriously instead of just being like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and I, so I'm, and I also don't know what that even really means, right? Like for all these different things, you know? Um, but I think to your point about indicator species, like the, my main worry has always been, and I know we talked about this a little bit, my main worry has been that when we take someone else as an indicator species, we're almost always doing that using the narratives of naturalness um, and, uh, and a particular idea of what goodness is. Like we're almost always saying the frog is a good indicator species because it loses, you know, like it has genetic transformation so quickly that it ends up having no limbs or it changes sex so quickly. And so all of the things that we're taking as indications end up lining up with um, hating disability, believing that there is such a thing as proper gender and that it aligns with sex and that, that ma that's XY chromosomes or particular secondary sexual characteristics. So the thing that I've just been wondering is like, what would it mean to take as an indicator people who are not damaged. Like we think about damage as the indicator. We think about the illness as the indicator. And I think that's important. And I think that it does something both epistemically and ontologically, right? So like, and maybe this is like, it, in the stuff that I'm doing in Claiming Bad Can, I'm also trying to work on like, what does it look like to not do epistemic extractivism? Um, which is connected to, in North America, people who are resisting what they're calling damage-based research, mostly in indigenous communities. But I don't know, you know, because obviously, like, it makes sense that we look to damage as a limit that we want to stop. Um, and there are other indicators, and I feel sometimes like we don't have very good descriptors for what flourishing-based indicators would look like or how to like make an ethical and political assessment of what we want. Um, and it comes back, I mean, um, to uh, what Shiloh was saying earlier, but like, what, what does it look like to think about the Zapatistas say, you know, we have one no to neoliberalism and many yeses, um, but often like we're good at describing the no and not very good at describing the yeses. And maybe that's the thing I like about Eli Claire is that there's lots of yeses. But I don't know. I'm curious what other people are thinking about indicator species. Malu? Yeah, I was thinking uh, about, but what is Pogan called in English? Relatives or? Yeah. yeah. What you described before, that you have friends who's suffering from cancer. And also, if you talk about Alzheimer's and dementia, you talk about the disease as a disease of the relatives, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, we have a Danish word, but... Um, I don't remember the word. Hereditary? But... Is it hereditary illnesses? Like you... Are the people who are uh, close to a person who has an illness or something like that? Oh, uh... Because, you know, dementia, for example, Alzheimer's, the person who is sick maybe doesn't even know he or she is sick. But the, the relatives are aware of it and they suffer from it. So I was just thinking if you wanted to look away from the damage, but of course the relatives are then damaged in, the, in another way. What Does is that the make sense? Again? 
I don't think we have this word. This How about it? Melu, can you translate? <laughs> no, okay. Sorry. No, no, none of the Danes know it. <laughs> um, but I was then maybe trying to connect it to the 5G because I heard that the 5G, um, maybe this is speculations, but uh, it's, it hasn't, it's so difficult to measure the frequency. So some people think that it, it, place on the same frequency as the bees are humming so the bees can't find their way they, they get lost basically or like they can't communicate and we know this from the sea with the whales or whatever marine species who can't communicate while all the ships are uh, pollute, uh, polluting the, the waters so of course the bees could be uh, indicator species but it could also be the flowers because of the bees oh, you know it could mm. does it make sense right so looking at yeah so that's an interesting thing because we often look at like this individual is the is the token of the indicator species but this idea of like look to the relatives as the yeah. site of the experience that's interesting and i think also what is common for, for all of us here today is that we are the relatives or whatever it's called that word in Danish that we can't remember. Even, I mean, I don't know how we or how you are suffering, but just the fact that we're here today, that we're meeting up today is also this kind of trauma healing therapy. We need, we, we're concerned about these issues, so we need to talk about it. Yeah, thanks for creating a space for that. I didn't participate last week or two weeks ago because I couldn't, I thought it was too depressing to talk about these things. And now today I'm happy that I, <laughs> I joined in anyway. But you know, so Danny, you're laughing, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's scary. Yeah, I'm laughing because, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But actually, <laughs> also, I think that... Um, even though uh, it can be depressing, I think um, what it, it also gave me life <laughs> because Alexis's text is in a certain sense giving me tools to think differently. So it's, it's I think that's like tools for grappling in a way, um, being like different ways of noticing or like ways to engage with the world that like, leads with curiosity um but also just like yeah we are going to fuck up and we are implicit and shame is has like no you like it's not useful so you have to sort of like say yes and maybe or yeah and and so that maybe it's also because i'm i'm always reading this kind of stuff so i was like um also loving uh, anything work and uh, yeah the propositions and I think that um, the grappling is also a proposition in that way to 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 work with like in your everyday life that's like a daily research yeah I, I, the the quote that I just put in the the chat it's from this book that I just finished and I think she's she must be building on Alexis Shotwell's ideas about contamination and purity but I'm like, building on her oh, sorry. <laughs> she, she was one of my teachers in grad school <laughs> um yeah like this this idea I mean I, I I oscillate between you know the incredible depression I have my my parents both work as nurses in the hospital and my younger brother's a cleaner in hospital so constantly worrying about their livelihoods what's going on and then going to this utopian ideal of like oh my god everything is melting down there's new possibilities and I think somewhere in between that uh there's this idea of contamination of as collaboration right like if contamination has the effect of of like disseminating things then what comes out of that and I think you know things like this uh the zoom meetings I'm suddenly engaging in lectures in a way that I, I didn't before because I've always really struggled with speaking up and then suddenly I'm in an environment that I'm comfortable in and it's like it's so much easier to deal with um someone's just at my door so I'll, I'll let you continue that was really beautiful though 
<laughs> Love. Yes. Uh, so this, I'm going to try to articulate what what I'm what has been going on in my head, but it might not be very clear. But all the last things that have been said made me think about um, the I, the concept of safe space. Um, and kind of the the way that this like safe spaces are supposed to be some kind of protection um, for people who are structurally vulnerable, um, but how at the same time I see it also in some ways as a as something that is quite violent. Um, in the sense that it relies on this idea of of uh, well of boundedness and also of um, of not grappling um, and and um, so I taught in the u s several years and uh, I come from a well from different places in Europe, but it's a very different political climate on on university campuses. And I was struck by my US students um, um, kind of um, difficulty in talking to people who, whose opinion they didn't share and how they felt very often threatened by ideas that weren't their own and asked to be protected from that violence. Um, and then I was seeing another kind of violence, the, the violence of, of not accepting to engage with others' ideas um, and, and refusing to kind of jostle thoughts. And, and, and so I, I find it, I find that it, it's difficult to, um, you know, kind of to find a space that both allows people to, um, well, feel um, not assaulted, but also um, uh, find a way to, that that it kind of places where conflict and and disagreement and and several contradicting kind of um, positions can can cohabit. Um, and I find it I find it difficult to conceptualize such a space um um yeah and 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 i it made me think of that um and yeah and sarah you had something a little while ago yeah or there were a couple of hands that came up I wanted to follow on that. Um, yeah, I've, um, I'm doing my uh, master's in education and arts at the moment. Um, and yeah, one of like part of my thesis is looking into safe space politics. Um, and their dangers, I guess, or <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess like I struggle with them or with the, the pretense of, of safety um, because it does feel like it belongs to the same like, uh, I don't know, fantasy that we are um, inviolable and um, invulnerable or that we can actually somehow have a moment for that, which I, I, I don't want. <laughs> like. Um, I think it's important to recognize that we are like uh, frail and uh, and susceptible and porous uh, to things that we want and don't want. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the the sort of um, where I go with this this point in my in my thesis, at least, is to talk about uh, safe spaces and their kind of um, like in my own experiences, like there's certain things, certain experiences, like whether you're in like a, a space for black people or people of color or a queer space, um, it's, there's certain experiences which you can't talk about so easily or so comfortably. Um, 
uh, for instance, the fact that you might have uh, connections to a white family or white friends, um, uh, especially when, when certain spaces uh, use the concept of family to talk about people of the same skin color or the same queerness or whatever, this sameness as, a, as an identity marker. Um, and it's like, if you're not comfortable enough to be able to, to be honest about like who your kin actually are <laughs> in all of that complexity and complication, then it's not really a safe space. Um, and it's also kind of, uh, I find the kind of the thing that's rehearsed a lot in, in, in the safe spaces that I've been in at least, uh, whether fortunately or unfortunately, um, it feels like a kind of um, a telling each other where it hurts uh, kind of over and over again and staying in that uh, for better or worse. Um, but at the end of the day, because I have to deny certain parts of me in order to stay within the safe space, it just feels like I'm being asked to relive my social death over and over again. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, this is the idea that I'm trying to get at with, with the thesis. But, um, and sort of for these spaces, which I, I do think there is something to be said about radical exclusivity and radical inclusivity, of course. Um, I just don't necessarily think safety is the value we need to be looking at to form those spaces uh, that we need for nurturing, nourishing, um, support love all of this stuff um I, i'm not really sure how safety got into the mix <laughs> which i'm trying to figure out now it might be interesting do you know nick mitchell's work um he is a um he teaches in feminist studies at university of santa cruz california santa cruz it might be too specific to the US context, but he talks about the ways that ethnic studies and women's studies departments were um, leveraged out of struggle by adjunct. Um, so like, and, and what happens when universities uh, are forced to put those spaces in place and what happens when he was one of Angela Davis's students. Um, and one of the things that she used to say is in opening classes, she would say, there's no safe space. This classroom's not a safe space. Um, what we're hoping to do together is make it a safe enough space that we can struggle alongside each other, which is a really different way of thinking about solidarity. I love this quote that you've put up from June Jordan, who also, you know, she goes right in to, I mean, in that piece, the report from the Bahamas, right in to thinking about like, what does it mean to talk about blackness, you know, when I'm here on vacation and this woman is cleaning my room. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's like, how do we over and over again in queer spaces and spaces around disability, like how over and over again do we rerun the narrative that the way we're gonna be, yeah, the way we're gonna be safe is to be based just in shared pain in a way that recapitulates our own social death um, through inflicting the same violence, uh, an allied violence on each other that um, social relations of oppression are, you know, it's like doing the, it's doing the state's work, right? So um, that sounds like a really important thesis. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, we were also, yeah, just let, let me know if you don't want to talk about it, but other amazing work you were working on with the uh, hurricanes that I thought tied really well into um, the work of like the um, the concept that Eli Claire brought in with the restoration of the prairie, the question of like continuing to rebuild after a hurricane is uh has struck um yeah so i really appreciated that as well hearing about that some more yeah it was um so that work is also part of the same thesis <laughs> um but um yeah it, it's drifting between it, it's looking at ideas of safety and also ideas of uh of pain and otherwise like in relation to identity formation but also like 
thinking less about names and word structures for identity, but rather thinking about uh, yeah, the words that we have or the ways that we talk about ourselves, I feel are not don't have the capacity to account for the complexity of our experience in our bodies um, uh, and in the world, like like the changes in our bodies as well, like not just personal changes, but also like climate oriented changes. Um, and so I'm just, I'm, yeah, I, I've been, I was looking at safety to sort of talk about like, yeah, there's stuff that's happening, which I can't account for, like personally, <laughs> um, um, there's stuff that's happening kind of around me, which I'm in and which is in me. Um, and that, yeah, so I use that to talk about like the experience of hurricanes ravaging the Caribbean and also hurricanes being kind of object of that uh of climate change like those kinds of hurricanes like sort of the, the whole idea is basically like i my own queerness resonates my own being queer resonates with the queering of hurricanes <laughs> um and that those hurricanes are part of our landscape i don't want to get rid of them but there is something happening to them um as well as me or as well as my people or whatever <laughs> um but there's this like multiple querying happening um and that melchen uh text um uh, i hadn't read it um in its entirety but the one bit about it not being a queer political agency but a queer state of the present like i've seen referred to in several other texts um but that's stuck with me um in this work Maybe that's the the shimmering presence. Yeah, I love their formulation of that. Yeah, yeah that chapter that um, we talked about two weeks ago started in a commentary um, that I did on Mel's on Mel's book at a like a book panel that I organized for this book when it um, was just about to come out and. Um, and I just, I feel like there's so many things that, that Mel says, just like, just their brilliance is so brilliant. Um, just these kind of like uh, quick phrases, you know? So, so that's on 219, they say, thus both queer and racial temporalities are a kind of shimmering presence. They are less easily bound to capital or to any other regimented time or perhaps we could say that the time of capital is also no longer in the form it might once have been. And so queer and racially marked bodies are present, that is in the present time, but strangely so, embracing anachronism and touching the past. Um, and I think that there's something that is also so useful there in thinking about, I mean, I guess also the space like, because something else that you bring up, Adam, is around this question of what does it mean to occupy a subjectivity that is um, scheduled for erasure, that is already erased, that is already rendered as impossible? Um, and just, I mean, the, the crew of people around Fred Moten and around people who are thinking with and against, uh, right? So this is also another thing that I always take from Angela Davis, right? Like, what does it mean to think with and against, in this case, um, Afro-pessimism? Uh, Right, and, and there's something there that's very complicated in terms of asserting present existence without um, sanctioning the past that has produced our present existence. So like embracing while rejecting, and that comes back to grappling, I think, you know. Can I, can I ask you about your um, your comment earlier, Alexis, when you were talking about taking the 5G conspiracy theorists seriously. Is that what, you, yeah. So, and maybe you can say a little bit more about that in terms of grappling and the types of struggles, like, uh, you know, 
for me, we were talking about grappling earlier. I really thought about all the struggles myself and my peers have and how they seem insurmountable in some ways. And, you know, you, you can talk about struggle as a positive thing if it's against an oppression, but our daily struggles or our internal struggles are little prisons as well. And, um, yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about struggle and caring for things that are difficult to care for, like the five Gs, you know? Does that yeah. Does anyone else have any things coming to them about how to care for someone that you think is completely wrong? No, I just, I'm, I'm just thinking like, um, during my work, like talking to people, for instance, in this small town, who I ask if I can like gather their vegetables and like I want to make something with that and then I follow them on 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 Facebook uh, and then they like post things about like anti-vaccine anti-trans uh, smart to peat kind of things and then it's like yeah it gets like really sticky suddenly because they're of course against this factory that's polluting their community but with that maybe also comes a lot of theories about vaccines causing transness and things like that where you're just like what like i don't want to ever talk to you again but then yeah kind of stuff yeah tricky yeah Oh, did you have a thought? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just curious because caring, okay, yeah, did you say caring for someone you don't agree with? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, okay, it's a bit slow, the connection here. Um, I'm working with Lars von Trier. I'm wondering if anyone has seen his movies because, you know, sometimes I struggle a bit working with this guy who's insane <laughs> you know <laughs> so um i'm just laying it out there if anyone has um, a good uh, idea how to how to care for Lars von Trier if you don't always agree with him i don't know his work <laughs> is That's it, is very it very long? you have to <laughs> unmute when you're laughing danny i would love to see you laughing <laughs> Um, Alexis <laughs> is a um, really famous film director who came out of um, the sort of 90s with this type of filmmaking that um, could be said to be exploiting people with Down syndrome and sort of people of disabilities, but using them as kind of almost monstrous figures. And he's gone on to make a number of polemical films about uh, rape, about um, sex addiction, about um, depression and suicide that are really these kind of like, they're sort of a mashup between the most beautiful indie cinema, Hollywood cinema crossover, and but also from this really particular white, almost like Tarantino, I'm just gonna talk about this subject, it doesn't matter kind of perspective. That's how I kind of take him. And so he's really divisive and he's really quite, like he's almost, you know, part of the twittering club. Like they love him because he'll stand up and say something about the Nazis weren't so bad in like Cannes or something, you know, and everyone goes like, oh, wow, that, you know. But yeah, so that's who Lars von Trier is, which made me really, sorry, Melissa, which really made me laugh that he, you were talking about how to care for Lars von Trier. <laughs> I also love how it's becoming like a, a work group, <laughs> it's like how to deal with problematic people. No, 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 sorry. Don't, no, no, no. no, no I, I started it, yeah. I mean, I can see this title in Medium coming up in the next week of a big article, how to deal with Lars von Trier. <laughs> An exploration of toxicity. Um, you know, he's not toxic, he's very porous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, so the, um, so I have like a condescending response and then something that maybe I actually feel is like maybe productive or so the, the condescending response is like the best form of care is giving people the tools to find their way toward, um, like 
living in a shared reality, um, however they're going to. So, um, so that's a sort of, but the way that that's condescending is that it's basically like, probably you just don't understand the world. So, and I do. Uh, so I'll educate you so that you can make a clear delineation between real threats and how to assess them. And, you know, like, because like a lot of times when I talk to parents who are hesitant about vaccination, when I get into it, it's actually like, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's reasonable, right? Like, uh, the vaccination, vaccination schedule in North America is not based on the well-being of the kid. It's based on the public health belief that parents will not bring their children in regular things. And that does mean that you give this shot at this date and it's more than you probably would ideally do if you could trust the parents to come, you know, in this more spaced out thing and get lower doses. So there's actually like quite a lot of truth in the whole thing. Um, and so, um, so I'm interested in like what, and similarly to the mask question, right, with the coronavirus, there was a long time where public health officials were saying, don't wear masks, don't wear masks. Um, but really what they meant was you can't buy all the masks because we haven't secured enough of them to, uh, provide to health professionals, right? So it was actually, it was a lie and it was something that wasn't um you know they just don't trust people for good reasons right but then it's like i live in north america and i'm an american originally and so there's like lots of people that i just feel like we're never gonna talk to you enough that you would change your mind you're a racist genocidal eugenicist you know like you really do think that the weak should die and that you're not weak <laughs> so so then my like more politically hopeful approach, I think, to caring um, is partially to be like, what does this person need that they're working toward, right? So like, if, like, if my friend, what my friend who is, um, ex who reports experiencing an effect of being near electricity needs is the capacity to be away from electricity. Um, like, what would it look like for me to imagine a collective world in which that's something she can have and still be connected to people, you know, like, in many places, they're doing away with landline telephones. So the only option is something that she experiences, something that makes her sick. What would it be to, like, what are the costs to having landlines? I don't know. It's an interesting question. But then the most interesting thing or the place that I feel most, like, invested in is, um, so he says he didn't come up with it, but I remember Dean Spade, who is a really brilliant um, lawyer who helped start a project called the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and he's been doing really gorgeous work about mutual aid. Um, he has this concept that he doesn't remember coming up with that he did called collective epistemic privilege. So it's like you don't go and find the person who's most oppressed and ask them what we should do about the world. You look at what is the um, what are the people who are experiencing um, who are the targets of vectors of vulnerability, and how as a collective, instead of just trying to find one person and use them as our epistemic sort of bellwether, what if we have this um, other way of adjudicating how we're going to set our political priorities? Um, and so then we can say like there's a space for a gadfly, right? because of the way that they constitute something that allows us to have an ethical regard for a collectivity that we might not otherwise be able to hold in view. Um, but it allow, it, um, having that approach of collective epistemic privilege allows us also to say uh, this way that you're using, you know, um, actors or people with Down syndrome is participating in something that we collectively think is going to make the life experience and chances of people with Down syndrome worse. Um, so there's like, so then I think care, we could talk about like, instead of just caring for this troubled person or this fucked up person or this wrong person, we could have the space of like collective care based on collective epistemic privilege where we're 
more co consciously and carefully articulating like what our stakes are and why, instead of pretending that it's just natural or it's, or like, or pretending that, and again, this is coming back, this is just because I'm obsessed with it right now, but coming back to the stuff that we shouldn't know or that isn't ours to know. So not thinking that everything is something that anyone can know. Um, so like res resisting epistemic extractivism also through um, having an account of like who's inside this and why, um, which is never going to be, I mean, this comes back to another thing that Angela Davis always said, which is she said, we, we take our identities from our politics, not our politics from our identities. Um, so our politics are information and, and we can change them. And then we change ourselves based on like living together toward the world we want, right? Like, and that feels like the best kind of care. But I haven't, I need to think about it some more. I think it's a really good question. No, thanks for that response. Bye, you just... I also need to leave, but thank you so much. It was amazing. Very well curated and very well. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for, thank being you for here. yeah for being. Here. I hope to see you all again. You're all welcome for wine in half an hour. Copenhagen. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Maybe we should close. Yeah, I'm also starting to have a little bit of like hunger hallucinations here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just say? No. <laughs> thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. For so much. This Thank you. I hope to see you all some other time. Is there a <laughs> next one? I don't know. Yeah, not yet, but there are events coming, so we'll see. I think I don't. I don't think we're gonna just drop the reading room. Obviously, it's really it's really nice for all of us. I think. Yeah. Works well. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for being here for both. Right. Thank you so much. Um, um, it, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you. That's so interesting. Like everybody's trickling out. Yeah, yeah. trickling out. Yeah. Wow. Oh man, this went like just so much better than I could have possibly hoped for. Thank you so much, Alexis. So fun. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So generous and uh, and clear. And I wish for the last half hour I didn't have like hunger brain. But <laughs> 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 I, will, I will go back and listen again to the recording. Yeah. 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 Who knows? yeah, yeah. I, I will see how we uh, how we upload the t the first two sessions. I have to do some edits, but yeah, they will be uploaded eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, okay. and, and thank you also, you two, for. Uh, for co-hosting and um and i guess i i was just um alexis you can write to ashley about invoicing i'm not sure how that's going to work across borders but i'm sure you're you know how yeah, sure, okay. No problem. yeah. <laughs> okay i'll just be i'm going to redistribute i hope this is okay i'm just going to give it to eli claire who is yeah so you don't have to know that but <laughs> that's wonderful <laughs> Yeah, great idea. Thank you so much, Alexis. I hope uh, we meet in person one day. If you're in the Netherlands, let me know. Yes, this will, this will end. And I love coming to the Netherlands. I, my sister lived in The Hague for two years, so I really like it. Oh, there. really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay.